a recent review we loved. It goes, I've always had a difficult time getting my mind calm enough to either fall asleep or to stay asleep after getting up for the middle of the night dreaded bathroom break where my mind would instantly start racing again and it would be another one and a half to two hours before going back to sleep. This has done wonders to help me not only fall asleep but keep my mind calm should I have to get up in the middle of the night so I can fall back asleep quickly? Thank you to whomever wrote this lovely review. And yes, why is the middle of the night bathroom break so darn tricky? We're so glad to help you get back to sleep, whether it's at bedtime or later. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, including our patron Karen, who requested this story and also brought to you by bookstores. Tonight, we'll read an excerpt from A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter, published in 1909. The story takes place in Indiana, in and around the Limberlost Swamp. The author, Stratton Porter, was considered one of the most popular women novelists of the era. Elnora Comstock is an impoverished teenager who lives with her widowed mother, Catherine Comstock, on the edge of the Limberlaw Swamp. Elnora's mother treats her neglectfully and makes her go to her first day of high school at a new school unprepared. She is wearing ugly, outdated clothes and doesn't have proper books or tuition. Luckily, Elnora is a plucky and good-hearted young woman. She also has loving neighbors who want to help her. And that is where we will start. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Wesley Sinton, Elnora's neighbor, walked down the road half a mile and turned at the lane leading to his home. His heart was hot and filled with indignation. He had told dear Elnora that he did not blame her mother for sending her to a new school unprepared to pay tuition and in out-of-fashion, ill-fitting clothing. But he did blame that woman secretly, regardless. Wesley's wife, Margaret, met him at the door. Did you see anything of Elnora? She questioned. Most too much, Maggie, he answered. What do you say to going to town? There's a few things that has to be got for her right away. Where did you see her, Wesley? Along the old Limberlost Swamp Trail, my girl, torn to pieces, sobbing. Her courage has always been fine, 
but the thing she met today was too much for her. We ought to have known better than let her go that way. It wasn't only clothes. There were books and entrance fees for out-of-town people that she didn't know about. While there, there must have been jeers and whispers and laughing. Maggie, I feel as if I'd been a traitor to those girls of ours. I ought to have gone in and seen about this school business. Don't cry, Maggie. Get me some supper, and I'll hitch up and see what we can do now. Well, what can we do, Wesley? I don't just know. We gotta do something. Kate Comstock will be a handful, while Elnora will be too. But between us, we must see that the girl is not too hard-pressed about money, and that she's dressed so she's not ridiculous. She's saved us the wages of a woman many a day. Can't you make her some decent dresses? Well, I'm not what you call expert, but I could beat Kate Comstock all to pieces. I know that skirts should be pleated by the band instead of gathered, and full enough to sit in, and short enough to walk in at least. I could try. There are patterns for sale. Let's go right away, Wesley. Set me a bit of supper while I hitch up. Margaret built a fire, made coffee, and fried ham and eggs. She set out pie and cake and had enough for a hungry man by the time the carriage was at the door but she had no appetite. She dressed while Wesley ate, put away the food while he dressed, and then they drove toward the city through the beautiful September evening. And as they went, they planned for Elnora. The trouble was not whether they were generous enough to buy what she needed, but whether she would accept their purchases and what her mother would say. They went to a dry goods store, and when a clerk asked what they wanted to see, neither of them knew. So they stepped aside and held a whispered consultation. What did we better get, Wesley? Dresses, said Wesley promptly. But how many dresses and what kind? (laughs) Blessed if I knew, exclaimed Wesley. I thought you would manage that. I know about some things I'm going to get. At that instant, Several high school girls came into the store and approached them. There, exclaimed Wesley breathlessly. There, Maggie, like them, that's what she needs. Buy like they have. Margaret stared. What did they wear? They were rapidly passing. They seemed to have so much. She could not decide so quickly. Before she knew it, she was among them. I beg your pardon. Won't you wait one minute? She asked. The girls stopped with wondering faces. It's your clothes, explained Mrs. Sinton. You look just beautiful to me. You look exactly as I should have wanted to see my girls. I lost them to diphtheria, but they had yellow hair, dark eyes, and pink cheeks. Everybody thought they were lovely. They'd be near your age now, and I'd want them to look like you. There was sympathy on every girl's face. Why, thank you. 
said one of them. We're very sorry for you. Of course you are, said Margaret. Everybody always has been. Because I can't even have the joy of a mother and thinking for my girls and buying pretty things for them, what I can do is help someone who has no mother to care for her. I know a girl who would be just as pretty as any of you if she had the clothes, but her mother does not think about her, so I mother her some myself. She must be a lucky girl, said another. Oh, she loves me, said Margaret, and I love her. I want her to look just like you do. Please tell me about your clothes. Are these the dresses and hats you wear to school? What kind of goods are they? Where do you buy them? The girls began to laugh and cluster around Margaret. Wesley strode down the store with his head high through pride in her, but his heart was sore over the memory of his two girls. He inquired his way to the shoe department. Why, every one of us have on gingham or linen dresses, they said, and there are school clothes. For a few moments, there was a babble of laughing voices explaining to the delighted Margaret that school dresses should be bright and pretty, but simple and plain, and until cold weather, they should wash. I'll tell you, said Ellen Brownlee. My father owns this store. I know all the clerks. I'll take you to Miss Hartley. You tell her just how much you want to spend and what you want to buy, and she'll know how to get the most for your money. I've heard Papa say she's the best clerk in the store for people who didn't know precisely what they wanted. Well, that's the very thing, agreed Margaret. But before you go, tell me about your hair. Elnora's hair is bright and wavy, but yours is silky as hackled flax. How do you do it? Elnora? asked four girls in concert. Yes, Elnora is the name of the girl I want these things for. Did she come to the high school today? questioned one of them. Was she in your classes? demanded Margaret without reply. Four girls stood silent and thought fast. Had there been a strange girl among them, and had she been overlooked and passed by with indifference because she was so very shabby? If she had appeared as much better than they, as she had looked worse, would her reception have been the same? There was a strange girl from the country in the freshman class today, said Ellen Brownlee, and her name was Elnora. That was the girl, said Margaret. Are her people so very poor? questioned Ellen. No, not poor at all, come to think of it, answered Margaret. It's a peculiar case. Mrs. Comstock had a great trouble and she let it change her whole life, make a different woman of her. She used to be lovely. Now she is forever saving and scared for fear that they'll go to the poorhouse. But there's a big farm covered with lots of good timber. The taxes are high for women who can't manage to clear and work the land. There ought to be enough to keep two of them in good shape all their lives if they only knew how to do it. But no one ever told Kate Comstock anything. Never will, for she won't listen. All she does is droop all day 
and walk the edge of the swamp half the night and neglect Elnora. If you girls would make life just a little easier for her, it would be the finest thing you ever did. All of them promised they would. Now, tell me about your hair, persisted Margaret Sinton. So, they took her to a toilet counter, and she bought the proper hair soap, also a nail file, and cold cream for use after windy days. Then they left her with the experienced clerk, and when at last Wesley found her, she was loaded with bundles, and the light of other days was in her beautiful eyes. Wesley also carried some packages. Did you get any stockings? He whispered. No, I didn't, she said. I was so interested in dresses and hair ribbons and a, a, a hat. She hesitated and glanced at Wesley. Of course, a hat, prompted Wesley. Bet I forgot all about those horrible shoes. She's got to have decent shoes, Wesley. Sure, said Wesley. She's got decent shoes. But the man said some brown stockings ought to go with them. Take a peep, will you? Wesley opened a box and displayed a pair of thick-soled, Beautifully shaped brown walking shoes of low cut. Margaret cried out with pleasure. But do you suppose they're the right size, Wesley? What did you get? I just said for a girl of 16 with a slender foot. Well, that's about as near as I could come. If they don't fit when she tries them. We'll drive straight in and change them. Come on now, let's get home. All the way, they discussed how they should give Elnora their purchases and what Mrs. Comstock will say. I'm afraid she'll be awful mad, said Margaret. She'll just rip replied Wesley, graphically. But if she wants to leave the raisin of her girl to her neighbors, she needn't get fractious if they take some pride in doing a good job. From now on, I calculate Elnora shall go to school. She shall have all the clothes and books she needs. If I go around on the back of Kate Comstock's land and cut a tree or Drive off a calf to pay for them. Why, I know one tree she owns that would put Elnora in heaven for a year. Just think of it, Margaret. It's not fair. One third of what is there belongs to Elnora by law. And if Kate Comstock raises a row, I'll tell her so. And see that the girl gets it. You go to see Kate in the morning, and I'll go with you. Tell her you want Elnora's pattern. You're going to make her a dress for helping us. Sort of hint at a few more things. If Kate balks, I'll take a hand and settle her. I'll go to law for Elnora's share of that land and sell enough to educate her. Why, Wesley Sinton, you're perfectly wild. I'm not. Did you ever stop to think that such cases are so frequent there have been laws made to provide for them? I can bring it up in court and force Kate to educate Elnora and board and clothe her till she's of age and then she can take her share. Wesley, Kate would go crazy. She's crazy now. The idea of any mother 
living with as sweet a girl as Elnora and letting her suffer till I find her crying makes me fighting mad. All uncalled for. Not a grain of sense in it. I've offered and offered to oversee clearing her land, work in her fields, let her sell a good tree or a few acres. Something is going to be done right now. Elnora's been fairly happy up to this, but to spoil the school life she's planned is to ruin her life. I won't have it. If Elnora won't take these things, so help me, I'll tell her what she's worth and loan her the money and she can pay me back when she comes of age. I'm going to have it out with Kate Comstock in the morning. Here we are. You open up what you got while I put away the horses and then I'll show you. When Wesley came from the barn, Margaret had four pieces of crisp gingham, a pale blue, a pink, a gray with green stripes, and a rich brown and blue plaid. On each of them lay a yard and a half of wide ribbon to match. There were handkerchiefs and a brown leather belt. In her hands, she held a wide-brimmed tan straw hat, having a high crown banded with velvet stripes, each of which fastened with a tiny gold buckle. It looks kind of bare now, she explained. It had three quills on it here. Did you have them taken off? Asked Wesley. Yes, I did. The price was two and a half for the hat, and those things were a dollar and a half a piece. I couldn't pay that. It does seem considerable, admitted Wesley. But will it look right without them? No, it won't said Margaret. It's going to have quills in it. Do you remember those beautiful peacock wing feathers that Phoebe Sims gave me? Three of them go on just where those came off. Nobody will ever know the difference. They match the hat to a moral, and they are just a little longer and richer than the ones that I had taken off. I was wondering whether I better sew them on tonight while I remember how they set, or wait till morning. Don't risk it, exclaimed Wesley anxiously. Don't you risk it. Sew them on right now. Open your bundles while I get the thread, said Margaret. Wesley unwrapped the shoes. Margaret took them up and pinched the leather and stroked them. My, but they are fine, she cried. Wesley picked up one and slowly turned it in his big hands. He glanced at his foot and back at the shoe. It's a little bit of a thing, Margaret, he said softly. Like as not, I'll have to take it back. Seems as if it couldn't fit. It seems as if it didn't dare do anything else, said Margaret. That's a happy little shoe to get the chance to carry as fine a girl as Elnora to high school. Now what's in the other box? Wesley looked at Margaret doubtfully. Why, he said, you know there's going to be rainy days, and those things she has now ain't fit for anything but to drive up the cows. Wesley, did you get high shoes too? Well, she ought to have them. 
The man said he would make them cheaper if I took both pairs at once. Margaret laughed aloud. Those will do her past Christmas, she exulted. What else did you buy? Well, sir, said Wesley, I saw something today. You told me about Kate getting that tin pail for Elnora to carry to high school, and you said you told her it was a shame. I guess Elnora was ashamed all right, for tonight she stopped at the old case Duncan gave her and took out that pail where it had been all day, put a napkin inside it. Coming home, she confessed she was half starved because she hid her dinner under a culvert, and a tramp took it. She hadn't had a bite to eat the whole day, but she never complained at all. She was pleased that she hadn't lost the napkin. So I just inquired around till I found this, and I think it's about the ticket. Wesley opened the package and laid a brown leather lunchbox on the table. Might be a couple of books, or drawing tools, or most anything that's neat and genteel. You see, it opens this way. It did, and inside was space for sandwiches. A little porcelain box for cold meat or fried chicken. Another for salad. A glass with a lid, which screwed on, held by a ring in a corner, for custard or jelly. A flask for tea or milk. A beautiful little knife, fork, and spoon, fastened in holders. And a place for a napkin. Margaret was almost crying over it. How I'd love to fill it, she exclaimed. Do it the first time, just to show Kate Comstock what love is, said Wesley. Get up early in the morning. Make one of those dresses tomorrow. Can't you make a plain gingham dress in a day? I'll pick a chicken, and you fry it and fix a little custard for the cup. Do it up brown. Go on, Maggie, you do it. I never can, said Margaret. I'm as slow as the itch about sewing. These are not going to be plain dresses when it comes to making them. They're going to be edgings of plain green, pink, and brown to the bias strips and tucks and pleats around the hips. Fancy belts and collars, and all of it takes time. Then Kate Comstock's got to help, said Wesley. Can the two of you make one? Get that lunch tomorrow? Easy, but she'll never do it. You see if she doesn't said Wesley. You get up and cut it out. And soon as Elnora's gone, I'll go after Kate myself. She'll take what I'll say better alone. But she'll come. She'll help make the dress. These other things are our Christmas gifts to Elnora. She'll no doubt need them now more than she will then. We can give them just as well. That's yours. This is mine. Whichever way you choose. Wesley untied a good brown umbrella and shook out the folds of a long brown raincoat. Margaret dropped the hat, arose, and took the coat. She tried it on, felt it, cooed over it, and matched it with the umbrella. Did it look anything like rain tonight? She inquired so anxiously 
that Wesley laughed. And this last bundle, she said, dropping back in her chair, the coat still over her shoulders. I couldn't buy this much stuff for any other woman and nothing for my own, said Wesley. It's Christmas for you too, Margaret. He shook out fold after fold of soft, gray, satiny goods that would look lovely against Margaret's pink cheeks and whitening hair. Oh, you old darling, she exclaimed and fled, sobbing into his arms. But she soon dried her eyes, raked together the coals in the cooking stove, and boiled one of the dress patterns in salt water for half an hour. Wesley held the lamp while she hung the goods on the line to dry. Then, she set the irons on the stove so they would be hot the first thing in the morning.